Nick Rich, and we are Siva Coop, and thank you for joining us for our Lunchtime Health Sciences webinar on food insecurities in the North, supportive practices for healthcare settings, delivered by Zoe Brenner, registered dietitian, public health dietitian at the Northwestern Health Unit. I'm Jennifer DeBaker, and I'm the Health Sciences Programs and Partnership Coordinator here at Nelson University. And before we get started, I will do some quick welcomes and introductions. So a reminder about your microphone being off for the duration of the webinar. Our webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. You can find those links at our RS and NODIP websites under the resource section. Um, there will be a question and answer period at the end of today's presentation where Zoe will answer any questions that you may have. You can also feel free to put them into the chat during the presentation so you don't forget them. And we will get to them at, um, later on during the presentation. And all of our previous webinars are on YouTube and you can find those links on our websites as well. So in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, Nassim University respectfully acknowledges that our pan-Northern campuses is on the homelands of the First Nation and Métis peoples. The university buildings we occupy in Greater Sudbury and Thunder Bay are located on the territory of the Anishinaabeg Nation, specifically Atikamishing and Wanapatea First Nations and Fort William First Nations. Beyond a, beyond a land acknowledgement, we understand that rec reconciliation is a practice. We gratefully acknowledge the elders and knowledge keepers who share their gifts and teachings with us so that we may better understand and honor their wisdom and that of the traditional keepers of this land. Nassim University will continue to practice reconciliation by listening, learning, and fostering a cultural of mutual respect and trust. Our presenter today is Zoe Brenner, and she's a public health dietitian with the Northwestern Health Unit in Dryden. She is also a NASA MU alumni, completing her dietetic training with the Northern Ontario Dietetic Internship Program, NODIP, in Thunder Bay, following her undergraduate degree of human nutritional sciences at the University of Manitoba. Prior to entering public health, Zoe started her career as a clinical dietitian working across many inpatient and outpatient programs at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre. Having the opportunity to work across the healthcare continuum early in her career, Zoe is passionate about bringing the worlds of public health and the clinical practice in Northern Ontario. Originally from rural Manitoba, Zoe has fallen in love with living, working, and playing in small town Northwestern Ontario. Outside of work, she enjoys exploring the region with her partner and two dogs. So, merci beaucoup and miigwech and thank you. Zoe, thank you for your time today. We truly appreciate you um, sharing your knowledge with us. And I'm going to pass things over to you to share your screen. Thanks so much, Jen. I'll get things pulled up here and I will apologize to everyone. I've been sick for the past week or so, so I'm going to try and mute myself if I have a cough coming. Um, so, so bear with me on that. Okay, let's get this pulled up here. Looking good on your end, Jen. Beautiful. So thank you everyone for joining today. Happy Wednesday. Um, we do have a lot to cover today, so I will get rolling. As you know, we're talking about food insecurity today, which has really become a hot topic in both our personal and professional lives lately. Food insecurity is a really large, complex topic, but I hope through today's conversation, you walk away with a basic understanding of household food insecurity, including the causes and implications to health, what food insecurity is really looking like for people across Northern Ontario. Specifically, I'll be speaking a lot to Northwestern Ontario as I reside and work in Dryden currently. And really challenging you to explore strategies you can apply to your practice to support clients who may be experiencing food insecurity. Just an FYI, I will unconsciously use patient and client kind of interchangeably today. I recognize that most healthcare settings we're moving towards the term client, but I think saying patient is natural to a lot of us still. So I am meaning the same thing there. 
And in terms of using the term household food insecurity, I will often shorten it to food insecurity just to save myself a few extra words. Uh, but just know that again, that means the same thing. And given today's topic, I do want to take a moment to recognize that I really speak to this topic from a place of privilege. I am a white, able-bodied woman with a post-secondary education who has had both the choice and opportunity to live, learn, work, and play across Turtle Island, including the beautiful and abundant Treaty 3 lands where I currently live and speak from today. Food is so deeply personal to every single one of us, and we know that colonialism, discrimination, stigma, and Western views of health and superiority have really done tremendous harms on the Indigenous people across Canada and their relationships with food and traditional food ways. And as a nutrition professional, I'd, I'd really like to acknowledge the harms that this field of work carries because of that. Today's nutrition science in Canada was influenced by unethical nutrition experiments of intentional restriction, deprivation, and starvation conducted on youth and residential schools. These experiments were led by a federal team of researchers who later authored the first rendition of Canada's official food rules, which was a precursor to the first food guide. These harms and continued harms happened despite the fact that colonial ancestors wouldn't have survived without Indigenous knowledge of the lands and foodways. And in our current fast-paced industrialized world, we are again seeking knowledge and opportunity to reconnect with the land and our food. And we can't do this without the expertise of the people who have kept these lands for millennia. I also want to preface this presentation by saying I am by no means an expert on the topic of food insecurity. Although I'm a trained professional working in this topic area, you'll see through today's presentation that this topic is really multifaceted, it's complex, and it's intertwined with many sectors well beyond just food and nutrition. And although I've had periods of struggle in my otherwise privileged lifetime, lived experience is varied and unique, and the voices of those experiencing food insecurity hold great value, arguably more than mine will today. And we know that education and awareness alone aren't a solution, but I hope with us having a shared understanding and recognition of this topic, it's a step towards breaking down some of these structural inequities that exist and contribute to food insecurity and help us collectively provide more comprehensive client-centered care. So household food insecurity in its most simple, straightforward definition is inadequate or insecure access to food, primarily due to financial constraints. And in Canada, we measure and categorize food insecurity based on the level of severity or deprivation. So that can mean marginal food insecurity, which is worrying about having adequate amounts of food. It can be moderate, which may have a compromise in quality and or quantity of food. And there's severe food insecurity, which is reduced food intake, missed meals, and at the extremes going a day or days without food. The picture of food insecurity is especially complex here in Northern Ontario, as there's a lot of con compounding factors that influence food insecurity both directly and indirectly. And many of these are outside of an individual's control, such as housing affordability and availability, climate or agricultural impacts on local lands and waterways, the continued detriments of colonization, isolation and discrimination, as well as our northern food supply chain, where we're seeing high food and transportation costs and at times compromised food quality. And to further complicate things, we know that global events between 2020 and now have impacted the cost of living significantly. Through the pandemic, we saw labor shortages and supply chain disruptions, increases in oil prices and therefore transportation costs. And at a global level, we're seeing food production impacted by climate change, such as droughts, flooding and historic heat waves, as well as global con conflict influencing food like the war between Ukraine and Russia. And here in Canada, we're hearing of grocery giants reporting record high profit margins, despite coexisting record high inflation, impacting the cost of many of our goods, including food and housing. So 
rightfully so, the most common rebuttal we hear in conversations around food insecurity is that the cost of food is the issue, not income. And definitely in our current economic context, as well as our unique circumstances in the North, food costs do play a small role in otherwise income-driven food insecurity. But if we take a step back and look at trends over time, the cost of food has increased at a fairly steady rate in Canada over the past 100 years. In contrast, median Canadian incomes have fallen behind the cost of eating and living, and that gap has really grown exponentially since about the 2000s. And keep in mind that this is median income. Higher income earners can protect themselves from the pressure of these changes by adapting their budgets. They have that flexibility, whereas low and fixed up income earners are forced to make decisions between food and other expenses like bills and housing. So as you can see, food insecurity really is this complex issue. It's influenced by political, economic, and environmental landscapes on a regional, national, and global scale. And I wanted to point this out to paint a picture right off the get-go, just how multifaceted and complex this issue is, because I think it really speaks to that it's about more than food, despite the name food insecurity. Um, the remainder of the webinar, I will focus on food insecurity as I originally defined it, as it relates to finances, as this is how we define and study food insecurity in Canada. And the evidence has shown that food insecurity is a strong predictor of material deprivation and that income based solutions are what is effective to alleviating food insecurity. So across Northern Ontario, we're seeing really high rates of food insecurity, meaning we're regularly interacting with clients experiencing it. According to the most recent data we have from the Canadian Income Survey, more than one in five, or about 21% of households in my region in the Northwestern Health Unit catchment area are facing food insecurity, which is higher than the Ontario estimate of about 19%. And as you can see, most of the North is experiencing much higher rates of food insecurity than the provincial average. And I do want to highlight here that this is likely an underrepresentation of food insecurity in the North. This is because CIS data, Canadian Income Survey data, does not include those that live on First Nations communities or other small remote areas or those experiencing homelessness. And we know across the North, so including all of the public health unit catchments that are on this screen, 44% of the population lives in small population centers in rural areas. And this includes 106 First Nations communities, which represents almost 80% of all First Nations communities in Ontario. We know from other Canadian surveys that household food insecurity can be as high as 70% of households on reserve. So given the exclusion of these communities in these CIS estimates, we can assume that these already high numbers of food insecurity are actually a gross underestimate of true food insecurity in the North. And we know that food insecurity can really affect anyone, especially as we're currently experiencing some of the highest rates in Canadian history. However, we know in Canada that certain people are hit hardest. As I've already mentioned, Canadian literature shows that food insecurity is racialized. Up to 70% of households on reserve and 30% of off reserve Indigenous households are estimated to experience food insecurity. Individuals that live alone or single parent households also experience very high rates of food insecurity in Canada. And those that live on low or fixed incomes experience very high rates. Almost 70% of Ontarians that receive Ontario Works or ODSP are considered food insecure. And I really like this figure from Feed Ontario's Hunger Report in 2021, as it really kind of paints that picture of what that fixed income looks like in relation to food insecurity. So um, I've specifically pointed out rural Ontario, the first line there, as I'm speaking from Dryden today. Um, and with their estimates compared to the market basket measure, which is kind of our measure of a poverty line in Canada, Ontario Works recipients would fall about $1,000 below the poverty line every single month, and ODSP recipients would fall about $650 below the poverty line every single month. 
And you can see that this picture worsens as you move into larger urban centers. And we know that having employment isn't necessarily enough to protect from food insecurity either. Almost 60% of all food insecure households in Ontario are actually part of the workforce, which speaks to inadequate minimum wage and a lot of precarious work opportunities that we're seeing emerge that don't support the current cost of living. And the Ontario Living Wage Network, their new report is on the screen there. They calculate estimated living wages across several economic regions of Ontario and conveniently released their 2023 report uh, a couple weeks ago and found that a basic cost of living requires almost $20 an hour across the North. So food insecurity really is known to be a strong measure of material deprivation or poverty tightly linked to indicators of social and economic disadvantage. So what this means is that when money is tight, food becomes a flexible expense in order to fulfill other basic needs like housing. And this is really important because it means food insecurity isn't just about not enough food. It's an indicator to us that other basic needs for health and well-being are likely being compromised or unmet. And that's where we really start to see this connection between food insecurity and health status. We have mounting evidence in Canada that those experiencing food insecurity suffer worse health outcomes and poorer quality of life than those that are food secure. They're at higher risk to develop mental and physical health conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, bowel disorders, and depression, are more likely to be diagnosed with multiple chronic diseases, have more frequent hospitalizations and longer hospital stays, and ultimately experience a shorter lifespan, estimated about 10 years shorter than someone who is food secure. And food insecurity can be both a determinant of health as well as an outcome of poor health. And this can be a vicious cycle. I really like this image from Alberta Health Services that helps kind of visualize this vicious cycle of how food insecurity can lead to an increased risk of physical and mental health outcomes. And in turn, how poor health can make it really hard to become food secure or improve food security status. So let's put this into a real world context. Um, I can't take credit for this case. It does come from, again, Alberta Health Services. Um, if you can't guess already, I really like a lot of their work. <laughs> Um, but I did incorporate a little bit of local data that I will be showing anyways shortly. So let's talk about Jerry. Jerry currently lives alone in a rented apartment in Kenora. He's been divorced for quite some time, but he has two sons that live away in Thunder Bay that he keeps in connection with. Jerry recently suffered a stroke, leaving him with long-term health impacts, and he's unable to return to work due to his med medical prognosis. And although Jerry's employment income was enough to pay his expenses while he was working, he really didn't put aside very much for his savings over the years. His employer didn't offer a great benefits package either and offered no short or long-term disability plans. Now that he's unable to work and has recently been approved for ODSP, he's concerned how he'll continue to pay for his existing expenses like rent, utilities, and food, as well as his new medical costs. So after paying for a one bedroom apartment in Kenora, Jerry will only be left with about $170 left from his ODSP payment. To feed himself well, Jerry would need to spend around $500 a month on food, putting him in the hole by $366 for the month. So that begs the question of where's the compromise, right? We talked about that when money's tight, food often becomes a flexible expense to fulfill other basic needs. So is he gonna buy nutritious food, spend the money to heat his apartment or use it for transportation to his physiotherapy appointments? If we look at this a little further, um, let's say that on top of Jerry's recent stroke, he's also been managing diabetes for about the past 10 years with the help of the local clinic. Now that Jerry is on ODSP, he's feeling the strain of being on a low fixed income. Food insecurity is about those financial constraints, which means our clients may be making hard decisions of where their limited income goes. Food, transportation, healthcare, 
or housing costs. The health impacts of his stroke may mean he can no longer drive himself independently, so maybe he's relying on other modes of transportation that he needs to pay for. He may start relying on emergency food like the food bank to help cut costs, but that might mean sometimes the quality or quantity of food isn't always supportive of his dietary needs, leading to poor blood sugar control. All of these decisions about where to spend his money and time and effort can lead to feelings of embarrassment, shame, or guilt about struggling to meet his care plan goals or deter him from attending appointments regularly. Maybe he's socially isolating himself from friends, families, and colleagues now that he's experienced this life-altering event. And all of these feelings, all of these stressors can lead to health outcomes. Maybe he's seeing his blood pressure increase as a result. Maybe he starts testing his blood sugars less due to time constraints or feelings of frustration or defeat or simply not having access to adequate testing equipment. And all of this can lead to an increased risk for complications related to both his stroke history and diabetes and the need for more complex emergent care or even hospitalization. So again, to sound like a broken record, food insecurity is about so much more than just food and food access. It should be an indicator for us that other basic needs are being compromised. So in Ontario, public health units are mandated to monitor food affordability and most Ontario health units conduct this every year or two led by their dietitians. This includes costing a standardized list of food across our respective regions to monitor both food accessibility and affordability and how this compares to several income scenarios. And most health units will share this data often with an accompanying report with the intention of raising awareness and advocating for food insecurity and income-based solutions that address it. And you can see a few examples of this on the slide. Um, because we're over such a large region and there's lots of you tuning in today, you can check your local health units website for the most recent food costing report or media release they may have. Here at the Northwestern Health Unit, our 2023 report isn't quite ready yet, but it will be released in the next couple months. Um, but our 2022 report, which is the blue one on the top right, is available on our website in the meantime. And I know Thunder Bays is also on their website right now. So one of the most important and tangible parts of this reporting is the income scenarios, which really helps us visualize that gap between incomes and the cost of living. Um, so on the screen here, I am sharing some of our 2023 income scenarios for the Northwestern Health Unit catchment area, aka the Kenora Rainy River districts. As I mentioned, our report isn't released yet at the time of this webinar, so neither has the data on this slide today. So just keep in mind that it is subject to change once the report is finalized. And um, I'm happy to answer questions about how this is calculated, whether it that's at the end of today's presentation, um, or you can connect with me directly after this. So uh, reading down the left-hand side of the table, you can see there's four income scenarios on this slide. These are all family households with different income sources. And across the top of the table, you can see monthly after-tax income, which includes all eligible tax benefits, estimated monthly rent, and monthly cost of food based on our local food costing for 2023. And then any funds that may remain after paying for just rent and food. And so you can see that a household with children receiving Ontario Works is $650 in the hole just to afford nutritious food and housing for the month. For a household with a full time minimum wage earner, they end up with about $700 left. But these remaining funds are expected to cover all of their other basic needs for the month, whether that's heat and hydro if it's not included in their rent. Child care, clothing, transportation, school supplies, phone bill, Wi Fi, medications, and anything else that may come up throughout the month. Um, so here's three more scenarios. Um, these are now single person household scenarios with various income sources. And you can see that for those receiving social assistance, they are in debt after paying for just rent and nutritious food, leaving no money for those additional expenses that I just mentioned. Utilities, phone bill, transportation, household supplies. 
In contrast, you can see the slight protective effect that the old age security guaranteed income supplement has for a single person over 65. This is a form of basic income in Canada, which I won't be getting into just for the sake of time in today's webinar. But basic income guarantees have been studied and recommended as an income based policy response to food insecurity. So we've looked at what food insecurity is, the implications it has to health status and accessing health, and looked at some of the scenarios to really visualize how food insecurity is more than just food. It's a marker of material deprivation and is likely an indicator that our clients are compromising other basic needs. We also saw that food insecurity is really high across the North, and therefore we're likely to be interacting with clients affected by food insecurity on the regular. Because of this, it's crucial that we're considering food insecurity in our communication, in our assessments, and our interventions for care with all clients. I will preface this final section by saying that all of this should feel familiar to you as clinicians. I haven't thought up any new or radical strategies to share today, but rather I wanted to challenge you to think about your current clinical practices through the lens that you already know, being client-centered, inclusive, trauma-informed, and how this translates into supportive strategies for food insecurity too. So first and foremost, we need to be reflecting on our internal biases, assumptions, and practices. For most of us, being a healthcare professional means we carry a lot of privilege. We're educated, we make a reasonable income, we typically have some stability to our work, and most importantly, we have the time and resources to access health. For many clients, this isn't the reality. And with competing priorities and stressors, health isn't a number one priority for everyone, and that is okay. Of course, something like poor blood sugar control has harms and risks that as healthcare providers, we need to ensure our clients are informed of. However, finding somewhere to live or helping a struggling family member may take precedence over thinking about diabetes management. And we know that health isn't just about health care. It's heavily influenced by socioeconomic status and social determinants of health. And supporting clients through these other pieces of their lives can have a significant impact on their health care outcomes. So, of course, things like eating well and being physically active and getting enough sleep are cornerstones to good health. When we're talking about health and health outcomes, we need to remember that these health behaviors are only a small part of what affects our health over a lifetime. The social determinants of health, which I know we're all aware of, um, tells us that the context of people's lives is what largely determines their health. And many of these determinants are outside of direct individual control. So again, this is just one justification of why that client-centered trauma-informed care is so crucial in today's healthcare systems. Meeting clients where they're at acknowledges these larger drivers of health in their lives instead of blaming individuals for their circumstances. Uh, as a society, we carry a lot of assumptions and biases when it comes to health and health behaviors, especially when it comes to food. Healthy eating looks different for every single one of us. And again, that's a lens that we need to keep in mind when working with the public. Something we hear often is suggesting that low income households just need to budget better or have better food skills. And this can be incredibly marginalizing and makes assumptions about a person's circumstances, intelligence, skill set, and capacity. And we actually have Canadian data that people in food insecure households actually have equivalent food skills as those that are food secure and actually shop on a budget almost twice as much as food secure households. Another norm in our society is that when we think of food insecurity solutions, we often think of food based programs, such as food drives, food banks, community gardens and cooking programs. And food based programs have many benefits. They offer social connection and a sense of community and opportunity to develop food skills, maybe increase short term access to fruits and vegetables, and they play an important role in meeting people where they're at. However, things like food banks were never meant to be a long-term solution for food insecurity. 
We know many people experiencing food insecurity don't even access these programs in the first place due to barriers like transportation, hours of operation, cultural appropriateness, eligibility, or just the perceived stigma around using these services. These programs also aren't resolving food insecurity because they aren't addressing the root cause, which is inadequate financial means to access food. So although using the food bank today means not being hungry, that person continues to be food insecure. And finally, it's important we reflect on our own biases and attitudes around food. As I mentioned earlier, food is so deeply personal to all of us, and we're also swarmed with food and nutrition information and decisions on a daily basis. And because of this, we need to be sensitive to our clients' experiences around food. Although food is a basic human right, good nutrition really is a privilege for many of us. This pyramid on the slide comes from Ellen Satter, which I know I'm speaking to the choir with any of the dietitians on the line um, that we love her work, but this is her hierarchy of food needs, which is similarly structured to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I encourage you to check it out if you want more information on this concept. But really it's about acknowledging that when basic needs aren't being met, fed is best. And we can make our interactions with clients a safer space by avoiding food shaming and recognizing that there's probably a why behind food choices or meal frequency or medication compliance or appointment attendance. Um, a second consideration for practice is incorporating screening for clients. We are often screening clients for all sorts of things anyways. Um, and I just want to quickly point out this great quote that comes from a person who participated in the Ontario Basic Income Pilot a few years ago that says, it makes no sense. One of the things doctors tell you is eat right, rest, no stress, and exercise. And except for the exercise portion, everything else is related to income in some way, shape, or form. It's almost as if you're non-compliant if you're living in poverty. I, of course, recognize from my time in clinical practice that talking about poverty or income is really hard and uncomfortable and feels out of scope or it just feels wrong to ask because you don't know what steps you would take anyways. And Canadian studies on this topic have found that most healthcare prof professionals feel the same way. However, these studies have found that over 90% of clients think that asking about financial situation relates to better health outcomes, and that almost 70% would be comfortable being asked about financial strain during their appointments. And I want to emphasize here, because I think we all need to hear it as clinicians, including myself, that asking about financial strain is not about solving a client's financial problems, because we may not be able to do that. Instead, it's about understanding how a client's financial situation could affect their health, well-being, and care plan, and be impacting their ability to afford basic needs. In other words, you are not responsible for solving their financial strain or food insecurity, but knowing this piece of information about your client is a really valuable tool to understanding their overall care needs and planning your interventions accordingly. So an example of this is this really simple validated poverty screening tool that was created by the Center for Effective Practice and the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And it's just asking one question, do you ever have difficulty making ends meet at the end of the month? And remember earlier in the presentation that we talked about food insecurity as a really strong marker for material deprivation or poverty. And we know that poverty, as well as food insecurity, are strongly linked to cardiovascular disease risk, diabetes risk, cancer, mental illness, COPD, arthritis, asthma. So integrating poverty screening into patient assessments and EMR profiles can trigger this connection and trigger appropriate investigations and interventions. Two additional points I'll make related to screening. One, of course, that we should never assume who looks like they're experiencing food insecurity or poverty as anyone can really be affected. 
And it's recommended that using a screening tool like this is used universally for all clients and patients, of course. Secondly, I think it's reasonable to be honest with clients that it's uncomfortable talking about money and finances. And there's actually a few qualitative studies that have, that have found clients actually appre appreciate this approach as well. So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I know these questions can be kind of uncomfortable, but understanding your needs helps me plan your care better. And finally, the third strategy I'm gonna talk about today that I think is one of the most powerful ways we can support clients is through connection and knowing our facility and our community to help clients navigate the system more effectively to meet their needs. I don't wanna to dive too deep into one specific study here, but uh, this qualitative study that was done in a Toronto hospital highlighted some really key takeaways that I thought were really relevant to today's conversation, especially for anyone tuned in that works in more of an acute care setting versus outpatient setting. As we know that those priorities and pressures can be a little bit different than outpatient care and what those pathways look like as well. Um, we also know that for those using inpatient care, that might be the first point of contact for those that don't have a primary care provider. And therefore, many of those patients experience greater barriers because of their social situations. This means that they're usually sicker, they have more medical complications, and they rely on the hospitals more for their care. So this study conducted patient interviews and summarized some key themes. One being that patients know acute care settings are really stretched for resources, for staff, for time, and understand the realities of what can be done in that setting at times. However, what I thought was really cool from this study is that there was an overwhelming desire from these patients for plain and simple connection. Connection with their healthcare providers through compassion, trust, and providing non judgmental trauma informed care. They didn't want to feel embarrassed to disclose their financial concerns um, or feel that they were being judged. Connection in terms of understanding them as a whole person. Patients recognized that their unmet social needs largely influenced their lives and health and felt that hospitals and healthcare providers could understand their care needs better if they were also aware of these unmet social needs. And connection outside of the hospital, providing acknowledgement of how the social environment is influencing their health and helping them navigate the system to have awareness and access to community resources. So what can this look like? We, we already talked about screening for poverty of all clients as that first step. And now connection is really kind of the follow-up piece to that screening tool. Ideally, poverty screening and other socioeconomic information should be captured in the chart to support that whole person care and communication with the team. Maybe it's something that we're flagging and highlighting during team rounds. Beyond that, actionable should really focus on interventions that support access and or income. And of course, some places may already be doing these that I have on the slide. Remember, I said that I'm not coming here with new radical strategies today, but for some of us, this might include some advocacy efforts within our own facility or clinic. Is there budget to have bus or taxi vouchers on hand for clients that need them? Can your facility offer staggered hours a couple times a week to minimize business hour conflicts for those that can't take time away from work or childcare for appointments? Is there opportunities to offer different modalities of appointments to minimize the time and financial burden of getting to the healthcare facility as often? And it can also include supporting clients either directly or through referrals, depending on your role, to apply for services that increase or free up income. That can include social assistance and special diet allowance, grocery or medication delivery services, or support with their income tax filing. So to look at a specific example, maybe transportation across the city is a major barrier for a client to access care. So can your clinic provide subsidized transportation vouchers? 
can appointments be buddied up within the team to decrease the number of individual visits they're doing back and forth to the facility? Um, the COVID pandemic really expanded our use of telehealth, whether it's phone or video appointments. So although in-person visits are non-negotiable for certain care and assessments, virtual or phone visits have their place and have their benefits to improve access to care too. They've been shown to significantly decrease no-show rates. One recent study found that missed appointment rates were about 36% in office for primary care versus seven and a half for telehealth. And they save clients both time and costs associated with traveling to appointments, leading to high patient satisfaction as this reduces interruptions to their working hours or family time. We've also seen a general increase in accessibility services through COVID. Many pharmacies offer medication delivery, groceries can be ordered and picked up or delivered. And these transportation examples aren't increasing a client's income, but they may be freeing up existing income, allowing them to allocate it to other basic needs instead of, you know, extra taxi trips or clinic parking lot fees. And these supports may also improve their mental health. They may feel more connected or supported by their healthcare team to have the option to buddy up appointments or phone follow ups that fit their schedule better. Or they may feel a greater sense of autonomy with getting their groceries and medications delivered instead of relying on family members to help them out. Um, and again, connection is key. That was really the key piece that came out of that Toronto Hospital study. And this is especially important in terms of connecting with our clients themselves. They really are the experts of their own lives and key to understanding their care needs. So for some, getting help to access food-based programming may still be beneficial. For example, maybe they've never accessed the food bank before and they feel really overwhelmed on how that process works. However, keep in mind that not all clients will benefit from or even feel comfortable using those services and that's totally okay. Um, again, I know there's a lot of dietitians on the call here, so I don't, I don't even think I need to say that dietitians are a great connection here. Um, but that can be for a variety of things, right? Whether it's a nutrition assessment, um, we can also support income-based referrals, whether it's with special diet allowance or other connections. But those income-based or income-related referrals and connections is really what most of our clients will benefit from. Um, connecting with social workers, caseworkers, patient navigators, and community service organizations that will liaise and connect clients to things like housing applications, income tax filing support, employment and education opportunities happening locally, and transportation services. So just like healthcare falls on a continuum from health promotion or upstream to acute or tertiary care or downstream, food and security interventions also fall along a continuum like this. In public health, we love talking about moving the needle from downstream approaches to upstream approaches, meaning focusing on the larger preventive structures that impact health at a community level versus individual-based interventions and treatment. And I'll be the first to admit that this work feels kind of overwhelming and makes you wanna bang your head into a wall sometimes because it feels really big and beyond us as individual professionals. However, I want to acknowledge two things here. One, that as much as it feels intimidating to think about these bigger picture approaches, the strategies we discussed today can really help with moving that needle upstream, acknowledging the social needs of our clients and that they're largely impacting their health, screening for and understanding these influences and integrating interventions that help address access and income are totally midstream approaches to care. And I've kind of circled where that is on the screen. Secondly, as much as upstream approaches like higher minimum wage or better social assistance rates are really the gold standard and what we're trying to target. We know that doing work at all three of these levels simultaneously is both realistic, but also important and valuable to providing client-centered care.
And of course, you can be a voice in the healthcare world on food insecurity. Hopefully after today, you feel more well-versed in what exactly food insecurity is, the causes and implications of it, how it's impacting clients here in the North, and how you can incorporate considerations of food insecurity into your existing clinical practices. And maybe you'll encourage some of your colleagues to do the same. Maybe they'll learn something new from you after today's presentation, hopefully. And I hope that something stuck out for you today that inspires you to support and adv advocate for some of those bigger picture upstream approaches to food insecurity. Uh, you know, advocacy doesn't need to be this scary or formal thing. It's really about having conversations, whether it's just at your facility, in your community, or broader around adequate incomes, social assistance rates that reflect the real cost of living, affordable and accessible housing in our communities, and secure and stable employment opportunities. Um, so just to wrap up, I, I have listed a few food and security resources that I think are a great starting point if this is relatively new to you. It's by no means an exhaustive list. And as Jen mentioned, today's webinar is recorded and I am also happy to share a PDF of the slides. So um, you will have access to this list and these links. One being is proof. They are really our leader in food and security research here in Canada and actually just released their 2023 report a couple days ago. Very convenient. Um, Ontario Dietitians in Public Health or ODPH has a really comprehensive position statement on food insecurity and evidence based solutions at different levels, as well as a template letter if you're interested in writing to a local or provincial politician on this topic. I would also encourage you to take a few minutes to play make the month. It's a poverty simulation, you know, game in quotations developed by the United Way. Um, and maybe something to keep in your back, back pocket, because I think it's a really great activity for students or interns to work through and just encourage them to think about food insecurity and their client interactions as well. Some other resources that you may find valuable related to just integrating food and security approaches more into your practice. One being looking at your local public health unit website. Um, most health units did food costing this year, so you can watch their website for any media releases or rep reports about what that's looking like in your region. Um, the income scenarios that I shared today are specific to Northwestern Ontario or the Kenora Rainy River districts. Um, you can also check out the Center for Effective Practices website. They have their poverty screening tool for free online, as well as some accompanying resources on poverty and health. You can connect with your local district social services, administrative boards, or even review 211 Ontario online if you want to improve your familiarity with local community resources for your clients. Um, as was already evident today, I really love Alberta Health Services materials as well. They do have a document on food and security actions in healthcare, as well as a set of video modules that again are free for healthcare providers on addressing financial strain with clients. My references, and that's all. Oh my God, I'm out of breath. Um, I hopefully I caught all of my coughs on mute. Um, so I just want to say thank you again for everyone that joined today. I am happy to answer any questions from the group. You're also welcome to connect with me directly anytime. My email is on the slide. Um, and I'll just put a plug in maybe for me and Jen that we'd really appreciate if you fill out the webinar evaluation that will come out after this. It helps NOS and you and myself know how topics like this are meeting your needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. That was just amazing. And so we could just open it up for any questions. Feel free to take yourself off of mute or put it in the chat. Stop sharing. I wasn't able to see the chat. Okay. No questions? It's always a toss up if that's a good or a bad thing. 
Zoe, it's Kim McGibbon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me at the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for all of that research. I ironically used some of some of your work already because, as you know, you put it into a tool for us. Some of this data you've been collecting, I used it to do an interview with yesterday. Um, but I am curious about because I missed the beginning. Um, whether you're sharing these slides, are they shareable for us? Yeah, I can definitely PDF and share the slides. Um, I don't know, maybe it's easiest if I send them out through Jen. Yeah, what? yeah if you send them to me, so we, we'll attach them to the evaluation so that everybody has a copy. Awesome. Thanks, Jen and Zoe. Thanks, Kim. Zoe, it's Kara Green. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was fantastic. You you do note it proud. <laughs> I know Denise has a huge smile on her face right now. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just want to say as, a, as an old clinician, um, it was always very hard for me to bridge um, the incredible knowledge that our public health dietitians provide us with, with actual, um, you know, on the ground <laughs> sort of actions and statements we can say to our patients and clients. And you, you provided a, a, a couple, you know, several minutes of that for us. I think those were very practical and tangible suggestions of how to take this knowledge and apply it to an interview with a client or patient. So um, on behalf of new and old clinicians, thank you for that. I think it was quite helpful. Thanks, Kara. It does feel like two different worlds a lot of the times, right? So um, this was a, a Pretty cool endeavor. So thank you to Nawesome for having me today to kind of like try to connect those dots, right? And as I mentioned a few times, these this isn't radical or new, but just shifting how we're thinking about the things that we're already doing. Um, and maybe a little bit of validation that it is uncomfortable and maybe feels a little out of scope at times, but it isn't. Anyone else? Hi, Zoe. This is Tim here from Thunder Bay. Thanks so much for um, a really informative presentation. I'm curious if you have any comments on the idea of food prescription, particularly programs that connect people um, maybe to like a food bank or community food program. So healthcare provider provides the recommendation they can then go and get a veg box or something else like that. Yeah, I just know there's a lot of talk about that, both in the US especially, but also here. Um, it's interesting because I feel like that's been coming up in conversation more and more, despite a lot of these food prescription programs existing for quite some time. Um, so I know, Proof, who I mentioned is kind of like our food insecurity research leader. Um, they really do not support food prescription programs, mostly from that stance of it, it's not addressing that root cause, right? It's really not addressing that income piece, that financial means to consistent, reliable food. Um, however, I feel like it kind of falls where most of our conversation was today and kind of like that midstream realm that it is maybe freeing up some other income to have that access that is kind of like prescribed through your healthcare provider. It might offer um, that improved patient provider relationship and connection with their healthcare team as well. Um, it might alleviate some mental strain to know that they have access through that program. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I just don't know if they're um, the, the end all be all, right? Thank you. Anyone else? I appreciate as well that you're spending your lunch hour with me. I know I'm the outlier on central time, so my lunch hasn't even started yet. There has to be one more question. I just, it, it's Kim again, like I wasn't going to ask until everybody had chances to, to say things. 
Um, my only question is about, and I know because this is awesome, right? It's a question. I know last year I was asked to do a presentation to like first year medical students. And I feel like your presentation is better than the one I gave and that it should go to those first year medical students. Uh, it's also very up to date and it's very practical on what people can do and how they can do that. Um, and I just wonder if that's something that's come across any of the minds of the people uh, at the table. Well, thank you, Kim. That's very nice of you. I'm sure you did a fantastic presentation. <laughs> I'm sure you did, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> I gave an um. <laughs> I'll be honest, I don't know that portion of the curriculum very well in UME, Kim. You probably know more than I, but um, I think when they reach out to you for that lecture again next year, you can make these suggestions if you like. That helpful. <laughs> sure, I should start checking my NOSM emails. I guess is what that yeah. means. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would also say, Kim, if you enjoy doing that presentation, I, I mean, I'm going to share today's slides anyways. You're more than welcome to pull. You know, my my strategies that I shared today that is totally okay and appropriate. <laughs> Perfect. I just think it's really important that this information goes beyond, you know, this group, because I think, you know, because of the, the, the way that NOSM is framed, we have the opportunity to train new, new folks that are coming out into the world and to ask these important questions and to think about this bigger picture. Um, yeah, that's all. That's why I just wanted to say it out loud to the, the powers that happen to be at the table. Well, thank you, Kim. We'll ask one more time for questions. Well, on behalf of Nassim University, Zoe, thank you so much for your time today. It was an incredible presentation. And we will provide all of the slides to all of you in attendance. And please fill out those evaluations. It is helpful for myself as well as Zoe. So thank you again. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. So one.